Nina, what can you tell me about phase two of the MCU? Okay, so basically the Marvel Cinematic Universe had already smushed half a dozen seemingly disparate characters into a cohesive narrative with the Avengers, beating the odds and spitting in the eye of hubris. But as we all know from the story of Icarus, there's only one thing you can do once you've flown too close to the sun. Die horribly? No, fly even closer to the sun and hope that Robert Downey Jr. doesn't get sick of money. That brings us to Iron Man 3. At this point, Marvel was eager to avoid the missteps of the last Iron Man movie, which fans decried as a retread of themes from the first. Evil business rivals of Tony Stark betraying his trust and attempt to build a more perfect fighting machine, all while Tony grapples with his troubled past. You know the drill. Okay, so what happens in Iron Man 3? An old business rival of Tony Stark betrays his trust in an attempt to build a more perfect fighting machine all while... Oh, okay. Who's the bad guy in this one? Unimportant. Oh. There's a kid sidekick, though. Oh. Up next is Thor the Dark World. Oh. Now, the MCU was already replete with MacGuffins at this point, and a grand plan was concocted to turn each successive MacGuffin into a more important Easter egg. Mm, an egg MacGuffin? It starts with the Aether, also known as the Reality Stone, which is used in the second Thor movie to change Natalie Portman from an agency-free kissing machine into a sick girl who needs a strong man to save her. Nevertheless, she persisted. Besides that, Thor 2 is a huge nothing burger. It just stars the guy who vocally hated being in Doctor Who as the guy who vocally hated being in this. All right, cool. Who's the bad guy in that one? Unimportant. Captain America the Winter Soldier, on the other hand, saw the dawning of a new age in the MCU, introducing the Russo brothers to the director's chairs that an impish Kevin Feige slyly coated with super glue. Uh-huh. Add a dash of Robert Redford, a pair of semi-reunited World War II buddies with undeniable romantic chemistry, and a jumpy French guy who does kicking, and you've got yourself a recipe for success. Now, I hope you don't mind me asking, but does this movie cover the dangers of drones and ideological extremism? Oh, it certainly did. Oh, man. I would have hated it if the only movie from that era exploring those ideas was the RoboCop remake. Right, and Star Trek Into Darkness. The Bourne Legacy. Oblivion. The Giver. X-Men Days of Future Past. London Has Fallen. Spider-Man Far From Home. The Child's Play remake, and, and so on. Yeah, right. Uh, just don't worry about it. Okay. By this point, the MCU stable of available A-list characters had more or less burned down, so a grand experiment was conducted in which a visionary indie director was handed a wad of D-list characters and told to do whatever he wanted. The result was a movie that brought Marvel into the stars and inadvertently fucked up the DC movies for almost a decade. Guardians of the Galaxy. Ooh, who's the bad guy in that? Unimportant. Yeah. Okay, so Iron Man's had three movies at this point. Thor and Cap have each had two. They gave one to a talking tree and a raccoon with a gun who've never even been to Earth. It's probably about time for a Black Widow movie, right? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, with four films worth of world building out of the way, it came time for a newer, bigger, more ambitious Avengers team up. Something fresh, something never before seen. Something exploring the dangers of drones and ideological extremism. Absolutely. In Avengers Age of Ultron, the team fights Tony's superciliousness in the form of a James Spader robot. On a grander scale, they fight the inevitability of the franchise's stars wanting to move on with their lives by introducing new, hungry actors that are comfortable with their contracts, ending in an ellipses and a winky emoji. Vision, Scarlet Witch, and Quicksilver all make their debuts, and most of them don't even get shot to death. An epic battle is fought on a flying city between the forces of good and evil, culminating in the last second circumvention of an extinction level event. Well, it sounds like phase two of the MCU gets tied up in one heck of a bow, and I want to thank you That's bro. not the end of phase two. It's not? No, idiot. The end of phase two is Ant-Man. Oh, uh, well, well, what does that introduce to the universe? Uh, Ant-Man? Oh, who's the bad guy in that one? Oh, stepdads. Talk about Thanos. 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 <sighs> Fine. I'll do it myself. Thanos is in it. Hi, this is Tom. You probably recognize me from the wildly successful show. Okay, so basically it's on YouTube and you can watch another one of their videos. It's like right here. Or maybe it's over here. The, um, I don't know where it's going to be. The point is you should probably like and subscribe.